Hey guys, hope you're well. I just quickly wanted to say thank you for the support on the previous episode, it means the world to me. If you haven't watched the previous part, I obviously recommend it, but if not, don't worry, I won't hold it against you. This is part 2 of my Batman Arkham retrospective series where I look back at the games in the franchise and break the story, gameplay and music as well as some personal history and opinions thrown in there too. In this episode we will be looking at Arkham Asylum's critically acclaimed sequel Batman Arkham City. So without further ado, welcome to Tri I mean a world without rules. In the last part I spoke about how Arkham Asylum single handedly got me into the character of Batman and I would be lying if I told you that its sequel was going to be nice to me after I delayed playing it due to Scarecrow, but that wouldn't be true. Instead I pre-ordered this game back in 2011 when they went up in game, but you see I got it on the PS3 and at the time the console had been around for about 4 years and I still had the original big boy. I'm sure if you're a gamer you'd probably have heard of the Xbox 360's Red Ring of Death, while well, the PS3 had its own version, the Yellow Light of Death. And yes, as I'm of course telling you this story, I received this yellow light as I got to the Joker's Steel Mill section very early on in the story and my console just crashed over and over again. Luckily my PS3 was still in warranty so I head over to Curry's PC World which I think was just Curry's back then and after a week of them messing around with it they were able to fix it and finally allow me to experience this brilliant game. Funnily enough that exact PS3 survived another 5 years before dying when wait for it I watched Suicide Squad, I mean what are the odds? I promise you my experiences with the other games moving forward were all positive, I just had some bad luck in the beginning there. Batman Arkham City released in 2011 for PS3, Xbox 360 and PC and was also remastered in 2016 for PS4 and Xbox One under the title Batman Return to Arkham, which included both Game of the Year editions of Arkham Asylum and City, including enhanced graphics and all DLC. The game was again developed by Rocksteady and published by Warner Bros. Interactive. In terms of returning cast, we have Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill as Batman and Joker, but not Arlene Sorkin as she had retired earlier on in 2011. However, Tara Strong takes over voice duties for Harley Quinn and although it's a bit controversial, I do think she does an amazing job as a clown princess. Arkham City was directed by Sefton Hill once more and written by Paul Dini along with Paul Crocker and music by Nick Arundel and Ron Fish who absolutely smashed this soundtrack, it's miles ahead of what they did only two years prior. This game takes place one year after the events of Arkham Asylum and opens with a group of two-faced thugs opening a safe hidden behind Kane and Abel's The Duality of Man. We hear the group are talking about rumours of Batman being in Arkham City and before we know it, that familiar silhouette appears in the moonlight, but it's a different pointy-eared character, Catwoman. After dispatching the thug, Selina cracks a safe showing us some kind of computer chip until she's held at gunpoint by the man himself, Two-Face. The screen cuts to white as we hear cries of pain coming from Bruce as he has an exchange with one of the main antagonists of the game, Hugo Strange. We see Vicky Vale reporting on Bruce Wayne's conference on the controversial super prison located in the heart of Gotham. The scene cuts back and forth between Bruce and Hugo's discussion and the conference school. Unfortunately for Bruce, it is revealed by Strange that he's aware of his alter ego and then we see Strange's men kidnap Bruce and throw him in Arkham City. We finally awaken and see Hugo right in our face, thanking us as capturing Bruce Wayne is far easier than Batman, which you can't disagree with, and then Strange begins telling us how if we intervene then the whole world would know who the Batman is, you know, the usual. But on top of all this, he reveals that since Batman has been captured, his mysterious plan called Protocol 10 will now commence. Bruce being tied down finds a way to escape from his current predicament, but is shown how bad Arkham City can be as we are brushing past inmates from both Arkham Asylum and Blackgate Penitentiary. We now understand how out of control this place truly is. Once we arrive at the main gates, we are taken by the Penguin. Cobblepot wants some good old fashioned revenge as he claims the Wayne's destroyed his family, but before we let him have his fun, we break his hand and free ourselves from our chains. We take down Penguin's goons and then deliver a knockout to Cobblepot himself. Bruce contacts Alfred and updates him on the situation inside Arkham City and requests a special delivery. Now using the encryption key we took off the Tiger Guard, we plug it into our new version of the cryptographic sequencer. With this key we are able to hack into Tiger communications allowing us to eavesdrop on their conversations and hopefully find clues as to what Protocol 10 is. 
Once hacked, we find out that prisoner 4011, or as we know her, Catwoman, is being held hostage in the courthouse by once district attorney Harvey Dent, or better known as Two-Face. With the Tiger Guards not intervening and allowing a potential execution to take place, Batman glides over and objects. Whilst we're battling a group of thugs, Two-Face shoots us in the chest and starts playing heads or tails. Selina loses, so she cuts herself free and scratches Harvey before he pulls out a second gun and is hoisted up by Batman. We question Selina about Protocol 10, but she has no idea what it is, but has heard rumours of Strange and Joker working together. However, a sniper attempts to kill Catwoman, but we're able to pull her out of the way just in time. Now setting up a crime scene, we determine the bullet's origin located at a repurposed church now containing a medical centre, but we're surprised by Harley Quinn and a few of her guards. We throw Harley and she tells us that Joker isn't feeling himself at the moment, but right now we need to disappear and rescue the hostages. One of the hostages is none other than Aaron Cash, back from Arkham Asylum. Now clear, we head up to the spire where we see explosives, Joker mannequins and the rifle that shot at Catwoman. The room is set to explode so we dive out the window to safety. We start following the signal used to remotely control the sniper rifle back to the Joker's location which appears to be the Sionis steel mill. With no other way in, we head through the chimney and only just avoiding molten demise, we're in. Moving through the internal workings of the steel mill, we come across the Dr. Harley mentioned earlier being antagonised and almost killed by a one-armed goon named Mr. Hammer before Harley intervenes. With the Joker holed up in the manager's office, we decide to rescue the Doctor and find a way to him later. Once rescued, the Doctor tells us that there is something wrong with the Joker, something to do with his blood. She says it's to do with the Titan, which we unfortunately already have some experience with. Now knowing that there is actually something wrong with the Joker, apart from the usual stuff of course, we create a new gadget called the Remote Electrical Charge, which will allow us to power up or depower temporarily disabled electronics. With this new toy, we head back to the manager's office and use a generator as a magnet to make a crane hook swing, smashing it into the office doors, allowing us access. But obviously it's never that easy as Mr. Hammer tries to slow us down with some help. Finally inside the office, we see Joker has flatlined and Harley is crying. Making sure that he isn't faking it, we scan him and see that the Joker has in fact died. However, from behind, the real Joker gasses us before Harley knocks us out with a baseball bat. We now switch back over to Catwoman shortly after the courthouse fiasco and see her wanting to steal the loot from Strange's vault. However, she'll need some help getting in there, so she decides after going through some options that Poison Ivy will be her best bet of breaking in. Before heading to Ivy, we go back to Selina's apartment to pick up a couple things including some caltrops and bollards. Now face to face with Miss Isley, it becomes clear that these two have a bit of history regarding some flowers Ivy gifted to Selina, but unfortunately it seems that they weren't looked after and thus died. Obviously that doesn't bode well for Catwoman. After fighting through some mind controlled inmates we are strung up by a vine and captured. Back at the steel mill we see Joker has tied Batman to a chair whilst getting a blood transfusion with the Joker's blood as a means for the Dark Knight to help find a cure for his condition. As when Joker took the Titan formula at the end of Arkham Asylum it has since been poisoning his blood which will lead to his death. But now Batman is also infected and the two of them don't have long. During this time, we're also told that Joker has no idea what Protocol 10 is either, so back to square one on that. Being kicked out of a window, we now have a way to stay in contact with Joker, and he tells us that Mr. Freeze has been trying to create an antidote to their conditions, but has gone dark. So we calibrate the cowl to detect heat signatures and head to the coldest point in Arkham City. This of course made a bit more difficult by the fact it's winter in Gotham, but we'll figure it out. The cow takes us to the old GCPD building, but it seems Penguin's men are already inside. Taking down a room of his guys, we interrogate the final thug who tells us a bit more than his boss would like, including where Freeze is, which appears to be the museum. So with a little resistance, we make it, but as we try to access a security panel, our cryptographic sequencer is jammed by some kind of military-grade device that Penguin is using. We scan for the jammer's signal and begin tracking down these disruptors. After destroying two of them across various rooftops, we hear over Penguin's communications that his men are setting up a third jammer underneath Arkham City, so we access the tunnels through the old subway system. Moving through the tunnels, we come across the final jammer and destroy it, now giving us access to that security panel in the museum. Now past the blockade, a T-Rex jumps us and we talk to Officer Jones, who is a part of Gordon's 13th Precinct Strike Force inside the city. He mentions that there were 10 officers sent in, but they were all separated by penguins, so we access a GCPD personnel database and determine the identities of the other 9 officers located somewhere in the building. We get to the gladiator pit, where we see Officer Best murdered by Penguin and his umbrella. As we attempt to throw a batarang at Cobblepot, he shows us that he has another hostage, so we refrain from doing so for the moment. 
Penguin sends a huge group of inmates who want to join up with him to attack us leading into the biggest combat section in the series yet. But once that fight is over there's one more surprise for us as it seems Joker was successful in shipping some Titan off of Arkham Asylum as Penguin unleashes his own Titan fog on us as well as some more goons. Once cleared, we head to a wall of ice which we break through and are abruptly hit in the arm with Mr. Freeze's freeze ray as we watch him do the same to another officer. Breaking from our confines, we head down to Officer Forrester, however the ice we are both standing on is extremely fragile so we activate an ice density scanner to monitor the integrity of the platform we stand on. Officers Strickland and Whitman are also in the room as told by Forrester, but as we start to move towards them a great white shark bursts out of the water trying to bite us. Now having saved the two officers in the room, we go to the armory as there are more hostages awaiting rescue. Once we've taken out the guards and saved officers Miller, Michaels and Sanchez we are told to have a look in the iceberg lounge for the remaining two hostages. Before we go there though, in the armory we notice Freeze's suit, but the man himself was missing. Without his suit keeping him at sub-zero temperature, he will not survive, so we first look for him and do so in the war room. As we place explosive gel on the nearby wall, a hand reaches out and grabs us, a brute whose name is Abramofici, I think anyway, with a similar appearance to Mr. Hammer, I wonder if they're related, and we battle it out. Unlocking Mr. Freeze's cell, we see that he doesn't look well, but in order for him to complete the Titan Cure, he needs his suit back. But as Penguin is using Freeze's freeze ray, we need a way past it which is information he understandably doesn't want to share. Pressed for time, Batman pulls out his cooling cell and proceeds to pour the coolant away until Freeze agrees to help him. We head back to the armory where we grab the security override chip from Freezer's suit which will allow us to temporarily jam the freeze ray and in doing so unlock a new gadget for us, the Disruptor. On our way to the Iceberg Lounge we battle the Great White Shark, not the villain, and finally confront Cobblepot. After dodging some blasts from the freeze ray we are able to disrupt the gun and get up close and personal. But Penguin isn't going down without a fight so he detonates the platform we're standing on and now we're in a circular arena with a Goliath. This Goliath is none other than Solomon Grundy. We battle the zombie, and after ripping out his rib cage and then crushing his heart, I mean, in Batman's mind, I guess he's not killing if he's already dead? Next, Cobblepot hops down the pit with a grenade launcher, and after some easy dodging, we perform a beatdown and put him on his ass. We bring Penguin back to Mr. Freeze where he throws him against a cabinet which has an assassin trapped. Talking to Victor, he explains that there was never a cure as it degrades too quickly. The only way to rectify this is to find a restorative element, but not only that, the enzyme needs to adapt and bond to human DNA. But fortunately, Batman has already met someone with these things in mind, Ra's al Ghul. Upon hearing his name, the assassin in the cabinet who is a member of the League of Assassins breaks out the one they're currently to Talia al Ghul of Batman's intentions. Unknowingly to her though, she has left a trail straight to them. Heading out of the museum, we request the line launcher from Alfred and begin following the blood trail across Arkham City, eventually catching up with the assassin and placing a tracker on her. Before Robin surprises to follow his escort, she escapes and Robin gives Batman a line launcher. We also give Tim a sample of our blood so that he can identify those infected with it and get them the cure once acquired. Activating the homing tracker, we continue our search for Raz. Accessing the underground just outside of the steel mill, we make our way through tunnels and sewer systems until we enter the collapsed streets of the old city. But we begin to weaken, falling to our knees as Joker's blood continues to poison ours. After a moment, we push on. Now under Wonder Tower, we come across a doctor being held hostage by Joker's men. After defeating them, we speak with the doctor who we find out were abducted due to being in the wrong place, wrong time. Heading for a door, we are at the entrance to Wonder City, an old idea for what Gotham could become, but we know how that turned out. We begin to experience dizziness once more and start coughing up blood, but knowing how close we are, we have to keep going just a little bit more. Coming to the main entrance, we notice that the door has been sealed for many years, so the assassins must have used another way in. Scattered around the room are mechanical guardians from Wonder City which appear to have a form of primitive video, so we scan some of these robots and unlock their shared memory bank showing us footage of a secret passage the assassin used. Finding the door, a convenient follower attempts to strike us allowing us to counter and use their sword as a key unlocking it. Going up through a manhole, we collapse once more, this time actually on death's door. Seeing the gates in front of us open and Thomas and Martha Wayne telling us to join them in the afterlife, until Oracle brings us around and tells us to find what we're looking for now as we have minutes before we die. 
On our knees again, we are stopped by some assassins, including the one we were tracking until Talia intervenes and we reminisce about old times in Metropolis. But we're not here for Talia, we're here for her father. Convincing her that we are ready to face the demon trials to become the new Raz al Ghul, she takes us to the first test. Raz speaks to us from what seems to be within our own head and says the first test is to drink from the chalice, which we do. But there is a benefit to this. As it is the blood of a demon, we experience a regenerative factor that brings us back from the brink of death, if only for a few more hours, but the blood will attempt to corrupt you if you let it. The next trial is to follow Raish through his world, but we can't touch anything or else we will die. Now that we have traversed his world, we now have to face him. The final test is to kill him and take his place as head of the demon, but of course we can't do that, so in refusing Raish, he rejuvenates himself in the Lazarus Pit, bringing him back to full strength. After fighting him in his world, he takes Talia hostage in a final effort to make us kill him, but we have another idea. We use a reverse battering to get behind him and open him up for a final strike. Upon doing this, we finally get the blood sample we need. Before we leave, we talk to Raz. He explains that he's used the pit too many times and that every time he does, he loses a bit of himself and his body slowly becoming a shell. He is scared of what will come out next time he uses it. We tell him he can have redemption if he destroys the pit as if it were to fall into the wrong hands, then there could be centuries worth of death and destruction. He could do this, or we'll be back for him. Now exiting Wonder City, we update Oracle on the situation and head back to Freeze at the GCPD building. On our way back though, Strange announces to the residents of Arkham City that he's dropped off previous warden of Arkham Asylum, Quincy Sharp, meaning anyone who has a grudge with him will be coming for their version of justice. We intervene on a group attacking Sharp and instead decide to dangle him precariously off a ledge until he tells us everything about Strange, which of course he does. We find out that Strange has powerful friends who would ensure Sharp's win as mayor as long as he turns a blind eye to his experiments. Along with setting up Arkham City and putting Strange in charge, a plan that obviously backfired for Sharp. But with all this new information there is now another thing to figure out. Who is Strange's partner in all of this? Back in the GCPD lab, we meet up with Freeze and give him Raish's blood, and with that, he finally completes a successful cure to the Joker's blood disease. However, Victor decides to crush one of the two vials he created and demands a new deal be struck, one that includes getting his wife Nora back from the Joker. Instead, we head to the safe where the other antidote is being held before Victor freezes it and we're locked in battle. Freeze is a unique opponent, as he will learn every time you attack him, meaning you can't pull the same trick twice, which makes for a really interesting boss fight. After beating him, we head back to the safe but find that the cure has been stolen by Harley. Now of our only option to take it back from Joker by infiltrating the steel mill which is in lockdown, Victor gives us a prototype he's been working on to help us get in, the freeze blast. Back outside we are cornered by a news helicopter with Vicky Vale reporting what's happening inside Arkham City before Joker launches a missile at her causing the helicopter to crash. Vicky is pinned down by the Joker's snipers so we take care of them and rescue her. With that little distraction by Joker we finally go back to the steel mill and enter through the back door leading to the sewer system. While traversing underground we hear from Oracle that her father Commissioner Gordon is being requested at City Hall where Strange is requesting that Emergency Protocol 10 is activated due to not being able to control the stew of weapons controlled by gang in Arkham City. At the end of the sewer we come across Dr. Stacy Baker again who we told to stay here earlier on when we came through the steel mill the first time. She warns us that Joker's men have been placing what sounds like mines in the room ahead. The doctor was right. After beating the thugs we find Harley tied up and gagged and like back at the asylum talks too much revealing a piece of Freezer's tech left in the boiler room, something we'll get to later on. Going through the manager's office we see Joker reapplying his makeup and getting ready to give us a fight along with various goons, a titan thug and Mr Hammer. This is one of the toughest fights in the game. The roof begins to collapse as we are pinned under a piece of rubble and at the mercy of the Joker before Talia arrives and offers herself up as well as the secret of immortality which Joker only takes seriously once seeing Batman Batman's concern and takes her up on the offer. Batman begins to black out after the Joker kicks him in the head, but before he does, he sees Talia place a tracking device on herself so that we can follow them. Back at Ivy's place, we see Selina still trying to talk her way out of the situation she's in and strikes a new deal. Ivy will help us break into Stranger's vault and we'll help her get her one of a kind flower. Pamela agrees and we're on our way to the vault. We head through the sewers where Ivy's plants have already found us a way in. To access the vault we need three keycards so we pickpocket the guards in the next room, head back to the security controls and open the vault. We take out the guards and finally have what we came for, a suitcase full of riches and Ivy's plant. Except Catwoman decides to step on it instead as payback for keeping her hostage. But before we can get away Strange catches us red handed so we have to fight our way out. Exit in the room we see Batman trapped under the rubble and we can make one of two choices. Exit through the right door escaping with the riches and leaving Batman to die or the left door which sees us ditch the treasure and rescue him. We pick the left door obviously. 
As Batman comes around, he sees Selina helping him out of the rubble. She mentions that they both know what Protocol 10 is now, as then we see Tiger helicopters opening fire on the inmates of Arkham City. Machine gun fire, rockets, you name it. Protocol 10 is about purging the criminals from Gotham, and what easier way to do than locking them all in a small area and lighting them up. Batman wants Oracle to stop Protocol 10 whilst he goes after Talia, and after his track runner is interrupted by Alfred, he tells him that Batman must save Gotham. Something Batman obviously doesn't want to do as Talia is in danger, but it's the right call. Inmate or not, he can't allow these people to die. So reluctantly agreeing with Alfred, they keep an eye on Talia's location while they work together to stop Strange. To do this, they need to scan Tiger helicopters to identify the master control program. Once we find it, we head over to Wonder Tower and unlock its doors. We arrive in the interrogation area that Bruce was being held at at the start of the game. Strange appears on the screen in front of us explaining why he's doing all of this whilst threatening to kill a man if we don't stop, whilst the room slowly fills with tiger guards. We defeat the room and head down to the sewers to access the elevator to the top of Wonder Tower where we see the intern once more. She tells us that Joker's men returned and began setting up fortifications before tiger guards turned up and killed them all in an effort to cover their tracks. Once dealt with, we enter the elevator where Strange berates us and how once tonight is over he will turn his attention to Batman's allies. Nice classic one there. As we progress through the tower, we hear Strange giving orders to wipe out the gangsters inside Arkham City. Now at the top, we see a circular room filled with armed tiger guards and Strange trying to spot us. Once we crack the code to his door, he brags about saving Gotham, so we give Oracle access to his servers and tell her to shut this place down. We show him what he's done, but he believes it's glorious, and Barbara finally stops Protocol 10. Strange does a monologue and then literally gets stabbed in the back by his partner now revealed to be Ra's al Ghul. With his dying breath, Strange activates Protocol 11, which detonates Wonder Tower, forcing Batman to tackle Raish out the window. Now free falling, we try and grab Raish, but he tries to stab us through himself, which we dodge, and he plummets onto the gates of Arkham City. Dead? There's only one more loose end, and that's Joker. He broadcasts himself with Talia on the front gate's monitor, so we reactivate her tracker and go after them. They're located in the Monarch Theatre, but it's surrounded by snipers which we have to take out carefully. Now inside, Joker demands the cure which we tell him he already has, which is when Talia pulls a reverse one and taking the sword and stabbing Joker in the back. It turns out that Talia had stolen the cure back for us, but before we can drink it, we think back to our encounters with Joker tonight, and how one minute he's on the brink of death and the other he's fit as a fiddle, which is when we realise that there were two Jokers all along, except one was actually Clayface but before we know it it's too late and the real Joker shoots Talia killing her and dropping the cure. Clayface absorbs the cure and we battle him. Using the freeze blast we are able to temporarily freeze him allowing us to grab Talia's sword and slice him up but then Joker presses a comically large red button blowing up the floor and sending us down to the Lazarus pit where we fought Raish earlier on. Once more we continue to freeze Clayface until we dive into his mouth grabbing the cure and cutting our way out. We drink some of the cure as a victory toast. Joker tries to activate the Lazarus Pit to become immortal, but we throw the sword into the control panel, causing the machine to fall and grind Clayface into the water, ending in an explosion. When we wake with the cure in hand, we hear Joker begging for the antidote, along with saying how, even though everything he's done, we'll still save him, which Batman even contemplates himself. But then out of the darkness, he stabs us in the arm, making Batman drop the cure and in the process smashing it on the floor, forcing Joker to lick it up off the floor like an animal. Joker screams in anguish, to which Batman replies, saying that he would have saved him even after everything, and it must have been pretty funny as Joker literally dies laughing from it. The final scene shows Batman carrying Joker's body out of the theatre as Harley and his goons look in horror as they think Batman finally cracked and broke his one rule. Then the gates of Arkham City open, showing Gordon and company also witness the same thing as Batman places Joker's lifeless corpse on his car, walking away without a word. Finn. Actually, there's one more bit, an epilogue if you will, with Catwoman in the museum finally getting her revenge on Two-Face for trying to kill her in the courthouse. So there we have it, the story for Batman Arkham City. Like in the last video, I will now go into the gameplay part of the video. There are 12 side missions in Arkham City, a huge increase since Asylum which had, well, zero. They include Acts of Violence, AR Training, Enigma Conundrum, Fragile Alliance, Cold Call Killer, Heart of Ice, Hot and Cold, Identity Thief, Remote Hideaway, Shot in the Dark, The Tea Party, and Watcher in the Wings. Acts of Violence sees Batman stopping various crimes against political prisoners across Arkham City. There's nothing more to it, just stop the crime in progress. AR training has two parts. The first has four trials where you have to use your gliding skills to manoeuvre through circles like Superman 64 and reach the endpoint. Once you complete these four trials, you unlock the Grapnel Accelerator upgrade, which allows you to propel yourself from a grapple point. The next part is another four trials except now they're called Advanced AR Training and as you can guess are much harder and really require you to know how to glide. 
Enigma Conundrum is everything to do with the Riddler. I won't lie, this one is a pain. There are 440 riddles in Arkham City, 400 of which are for Batman, and if you've got the Catwoman DLC installed, then I'm afraid you're looking at another 40 for her too. This side mission requires you to solve riddles, puzzles, and save hostages. Once you've solved a certain number of riddles, you will be given the location of a hostage you must save from various death traps. Upon saving them, they will give you a frequency that you need to find on the cryptographic sequencer, and the Riddler will give you a riddle to solve on the Enigma machine. You have to save 5 hostages and collect the remaining riddles and trophies to be able to confront Enigma himself. Fragile Alliance has you team up with Bane. Yep, that's right, no backbreaking this time, and you both have to locate six Titan containers which you destroy using the explosive gel. When you have done this, return to Bane and you'll fight alongside each other as a group of thugs try to attack you. Afterwards, Bane betrays you, but you have to trust someone to be betrayed, so we trap him in a room and destroy the six remaining Titan containers Bane was keeping for himself. In Cold Call Killer, you take on Victor Zaz. In this side mission, you will hear random payphones ringing across Arkham City. Once you locate the correct phone, you'll have to race to it before Zaz kills a hostage. Then upon reaching the phone, you'll have a conversation with Zaz. You do this a few times before finally locating him and avoiding his field of view as he has hostages. Then you can take him out. Mr. Freeze asks you to find his wife in Heart of Ice. Victor has a last known position on her and you have to use the Freeze Blast to break a weak wall and access a room and amusement mile. After beating the thugs protecting Nori, you head back to Freeze at the GCPD lab to tell him where she is. Hot and Cold is located in the steel mill and has you go deeper into the facility to find a piece of Freeze technology called the Freeze Cluster. That's it. Identity Theft is one of the more interesting ones and has you find various murder victims around the city. All of the victims have bandages covering their faces and you will need to set up investigations for each one. Eventually you will find the culprit and solve the mystery of why he's killing these particular people, ending in the reveal of iconic villain Hush, also known as the Identity Thief. Remote Hideaway, like Hot and Cold, is for an upgrade and requires you to head back to the museum and talk to the remaining GCPD officers you save from Penguin. This is where they give you the Disruptor Mine Detonator, which as it sounds lets you destroy mines with the Disruptor. Shot in the Dark follows gunshots in the distance and requires you to investigate how and where these political prisoners were killed from. Once you solve all the murders, it turns out to be none other than Deadshot and you face off on a rooftop. Again, this is one of the standouts as I also love the investigation gameplay in Arkham City. In the tea party, Alfred contacts you just after saving Vicky Vale in the story and tells you he's created an antidote to the Joker's blood disease. However, before you reach it, Jervis Tetch, aka the Mad Hatter, spikes the cure and submits you to a horrifying reality where you have to fight physical and psychological torture and also saving a hostage he's deemed as his Alice. The final side mission is called Watcher in the Wings, and like most of the side missions in Arkham City, are random events throughout and after the story. In this one, a strange guardian seems to be looking over you across multiple locations in the city, and once you approach his admirer, he will talk to you and then leave a symbol. Scanning all these symbols and positioning the completed piece over the Arkham City map, you will head to the church and be met by this fellow again who warns of dark days coming to Gotham. The gameplay this time around is much more engaging and consistent as in you don't get stuck as much since in Asylum you had to be quite accurate in who you wanted to attack whereas in this game it assists and assumes based on your action. For example if you go for a cape stun the game will prioritise either a shield or heavy enemy. Rather than a line of upgrades like in Arkham Asylum, this time all of the upgrades are broken down into five different tabs. Batsuit, Gadgets, Combat, Predator and Catwoman. The last one only if you have the Catwoman DLC installed, but it's quite hard to find a version of the game without owning the original PS3 and Xbox 360 copies. We'll start with the Batsuit section. By default you'll have Movement, Detective Mode, Slide, Drop Attack, Grapnel, Glide, Dive Bomb, Glide Kick, Environmental Analysis and Interrogation Unlocked as they are part of the core gameplay systems. However there are several upgrades you can get by levelling up throughout the game as well as one achieved by completing a side mission. First off we have the Grapnel Boost which you can only unlock by completing the first part of the AR training side mission which includes four tests to do with your manoeuvrability. And if you complete these four challenges then you request the drop off of the Grapnel Accelerator which allows you to grapple up and over a structure following into a glide. Next we have the shockwave attack which you can activate by pressing either circle or B on controller after dive bombing to the ground and will send out a shockwave knocking all enemies within the radius. 
The glide boost attack is activated by pressing square or X when gliding except this time rather than kicking them to the ground you will also hold R2 or RT and you will gain speed in basically throwing yourself at the enemy and if you are far enough away and the bat symbol meter goes from yellow to red then you will instantly take down the enemy too. Heat signature conceal does literally what it says. It conceals you from the enemies wearing heat signature goggles so that when they scan you you are undetectable by them. This only happens when perching on vantage points. Like the last game, I'll bundle these two which are actually 8 upgrades together being Ballistic Armor and Combat Armor V1 through 4 and again just give you extra health but rather than Asylum's health upgrades, these ones are specifically for melee or firearm damage so you could have a sliver of health with no melee armor but full firearm armor, then get shot by an enemy and not die due to having said firearm armor still available. Hopefully that makes sense. Moving on to the gadget set of upgrades, so by default you get the Batarang, Remote Control Batarang, Bat Claw, Explosive Gel and Cryptographic Sequencer. There are 5 upgrades you unlock throughout the story which are the smoke pellet once encountering Harley in the medical centre, the REC or remote electrical charge after rescuing Dr Stacy Baker in the steel mill, line launcher given to us by Robin after chasing Talia's follower from the museum, reverse battering once Raish takes Talia hostage and finally the freeze blast which you unlock after beating Mr Freeze in the GCPD lab. The freeze cluster is unlocked by completing the hot and cold side mission and allows Batman to freeze multiple enemies at once however only in place, they are still able to shoot guns if they have them. The disruptor mine detonator is also unlocked for a side mission called remote hideaway and lets you disable mines in the same way you would do to firearms. Leveling up through the game will give you the chance to get the Bat Claw Disarm upgrade which when using the Bat Claw on an enemy will take away whatever weapon they are holding. The Sonic Batarang, Sonic Shock Batarang, Cryptographic Range Amplifier and Cryptographic Power Amplifier return and operate the exact same as in Arkham Asylum. The Line Launcher Tightrope allows you to jump up on the line you've shot giving you a unique vantage point during Predator encounters as well as help with some Riddler puzzles too. The freeze proximity mine is basically a trap which you throw as normal and once an enemy gets close enough it explodes freezing them the same as the regular freeze blast. The final upgrade for the gadgets section is the disruptor firearm jammer which as it sounds jams an enemy's firearm giving you extra time to attack them but if they spot you they will realise it's not working and unjam it so make sure you capitalise in the moment. Moving on to combat, you have Strike, Counter, Evade, Redirect, Cape Stun, Projectile Counter, Ground Takedown, Beatdown, Aerial Attack, Ultra Stun and Blade Dodge from the get-go. Unlockable abilities include the Special Combo Takedown, just like in the previous game, but then you also get brand new combo attacks like the Special Combo Bat Swarm, which has you press X and Square or A and X together, once at an 8 hit combo and you jump into the air doing a Ground Pound which stuns surrounding enemies. Special combo multi-ground takedown where you press X and circle or A and B and you will launch into the air throwing batarangs and instantly taking down as many enemies that are on the ground. Special combo disarm and destroy allows you to break any weapon an enemy is currently holding removing it from the battle. You do this by pressing square and triangle or X and Y. Critical strikes and special combo boost also return from the previous game as well as a repurposed battering power upgrade from Asylum now called free flow power gadgets which lets any usable gadget in free flow combat do additional damage. The last upgrade for combat is free flow focus where once you get to a 12 times combo the game will slow down and your strikes do extra damage as long as you don't use a special combo. If you do then this upgrade disables until getting another 12 hit combo. The predator section are mainly unlocked from the beginning including vantage point, corner cover, silent takedown, knockout smash, double takedown, inverted takedown, great takedown, ledge takedown, hanging ledge takedown, window takedown, wooden wall takedown, vent takedown and corner cover takedown. <sighs> the only unlockable upgrade doesn't even require a level up as it's tied to the side mission AR training and is acquired once you receive the grapnel accelerator. The final section is for Catwoman only and gives you climb, whip swing, ceiling climb, ceiling takedown, pounce and a whip, with the bollards and caltrops unlocked through her story. Catwoman also has ballistic and combat armor but they both only go up to V2 due to the length of her content. This leaves us with the special combo whiplash where you unleash a flurry of whip strikes in all directions dealing massive damage. This is activated by pressing X and square or A and X. The final upgrade is the special combo whip trip where by hitting X and circle or A and B you spin on the ground tripping everyone up with the whip. That was a lot of information, hopefully I explained it enough or maybe I over explained it, who knows. Anyway let's move on to the next section. 
There are 7 pieces of DLC for Arkham City including the Catwoman bundle which has a story pack that I also talked through earlier and 2 skins for you to use, Long Halloween and Animated Catwoman. The Nightwing bundle has 2 challenge maps called Wayne Manor and Main Hall and also included his animated skin. The Robin bundle like the one for Nightwing had 2 challenge maps named Black Mask and Freight Train and 2 skins Red Robin and Animated Robin. All three of these characters are also available to use in challenge mode making use of their unique gadgets, playstyles and various skins. Next we have the Arkham City skins pack which had 7 outfits to equip the Dark Knight with for use in story and challenge mode. These suits were 1970s Batman, Year One, The Dark Knight Returns, Earth One, Batman Beyond, Sinestro Corpse and Animated Batman. Another skin was added for Batman shortly after the release of the Arkham City skins pack which was Batman Incorporated. We then received the challenge map pack which gave us 3 more maps called the Joker's Carnival, Iceberg Lounge and the Batcave. In the final and biggest piece of DLC we got for Arkham City was Harley Quinn's Revenge which is a story pack expansion continuing shortly after the events of the main game and saw us play as Robin for the first time investigating the disappearance of Batman after he returned to Arkham City to rescue officers captured by Harley. This DLC is only about an hour long depending how quickly you get through it but my favourite part of it is Kevin Conroy's cold delivery of his lines as after losing Talia and Joker he's not in a good place and seems like he'll break his one rule at any point. Give me the code. Yeah, yeah, no problem. See, I'm doing what you wanted. There was never any doubt in my mind. The music in Batman Arkham City was composed by Nick Arundel and Ron Fish which had 19 tracks total. There's callbacks to their previous work in Arkham Asylum with tracks like Call Him Off and revitalised ones like the main theme with an epic orchestral overhaul this time around, rather than the foreboding of the original. Some of my favourites are Have You Got My Location, It Was The Joker, I Think You Should Do As He Says, Call Him Off, You Should Have Listened To My Warning, and of course Arkham City main theme which has kept people on the main menu for years. Once more these two have outdone themselves and for many players this will be the peak of their soundtracks for the series and the last one Ron works on. In summary this game really opened me up to Batman's world more than its predecessor, introducing more characters and locations for me to become immersed in. This game is most people's favourite in the series but not mine. My favourite comes later and one of these days we'll cover it but not just yet. Hey, hope you enjoyed this retrospective of Batman Arkham City. Now you might be expecting part 3 to the series which will come later but first I'm going to take a short break from the Arkham series just for a little breather. My next planned video in a similar style to this one will be another classic from I think most gamers history. A game with an angelic soundtrack and share a name with something that angels wear. Anyway guys, I'll see you in the next video. Take care.